Grids of modularity are tools or concepts that we use often in design, mostly to create structure and unity. Modularity is a fixed element used within a larger system or structure. It is really a way of thinking or a constraint put on a process. Here's an interesting example of modularity. This is a room that's covered entirely in post-it notes. So in this case, there's a lot of pattern and color being created, but it's through a modular structure of the square shape of that post-it note. So there's a grid that's being used in the way these post-it notes are laid out and the modular system of the post-it notes that's creating these patterns in this very interesting space. Another great example of modularity is pixel-based design. So all screens have a pixel structure, and now on our very advanced screens, it's hard to see the pixel structure because the screens have so many pixels, it's harder to see them. But if you go back to older systems, like the original Nintendo with Super Mario Brothers, you know, if you look at the typography, you can see that jagged edge. You can see that there's a pixel structure that are being turned in different colors that are creating Mario and all of the other items items that we see on the screen. So really this is an entire grid structure of pixels that are the modules and those modules are being turned different colors to create the environment of Super Mario Brothers. Lego is another great example of a modular system. The bricks are different sizes and they're connected in different ways to create things. So the actual Legos themselves are the modules that we use and they come in different shapes and they connect in different ways to create different creations that you would build with Lego. It's also modular furniture. This is an example of a modular wall unit. So here we have some rails that are attached vertically to the wall and then shelves or cabinets can be put in in different places. So there's a modular structure in terms of where these things can be placed and then different modules that we can use, whether they're shelves, drawer units, cabinet units. There's even modular food. Chipotle is a great example. When you go to Chipotle and you make your burrito bowl, taco burrito, there's different modules that you're selecting. So there's different kinds of meat. There's the rice, the beans, the guacamole. All of those different items are modules that you mix together to create your burrito or taco. So it's sort of a modular way of approaching food. There's other food places that do this as well, like places where maybe you can go and make your own pizza. There's always the crust that you use. And then there's all the modules of the sauce and the toppings, right? So a modular idea of how you create food that you can customize for yourself. Another place we often see the concept of grids and modularity used is in icon design. So here's a piece from Firebrand Design. This is the Black Wealth Data Center. So on the left, we have the website. And you can see the logo and then the typefaces that they're using. But on the right is the icon system that was created. And this icon system needs to feel unified. It needs to feel like it relates to the typography, to the identity. So there's an angularity to it. There's also a certain line width that's being used throughout all of them. There's also probably a grid structure being used that helps make sure that all of the icons are a similar size and overall shape. So here, grids and modularity is really helping us to create unity. Here's an example of a very famous set of icons for the Munich Olympics. This was done by Otto Eicher. And you can see on the left the actual grid that's behind these icons. There's this square-based grid, but then there's also some dynamic diagonal lines that run through. So everything that is created for these icons fits somehow on this grid structure. And that creates a set of icons that identify the different sports of the Olympics in a very unified way. So if you look at the right, there's sort of a style to all of these, and that's because they're all created using that same grid and that modular structure. Sometimes we also see the use of grids and modularity in logo design. Here's a piece from Sagmeister. This is the Seed Media Group branding. So you can see their logo is actually this really interesting set of circles on the left-hand side, the front of the business card. All these circles that kind of line up in this really interesting radiant structure. But then on the right is the back of all the business cards. And it's kind of fun because you have the name of the person, but then you also have a portrait. So there was a part of this project that was created where you could take a photo and it would use the modular structure of the logo and change the colors of those dots to reference that photo as accurately as it possibly could. Obviously, you're not gonna be able, probably able to find this person based on these simple, simple photos, but it's kind of a fun way to customize the cards for each of the people. Here's one that definitely has a modular structure. This was a piece by Landor for the city of Melbourne. And you can see this M. And then the M can fill with all of these different patterns and shapes in different ways to create this modular dynamic identity system that really references the vibrancy and diversity of Melbourne. Because limitations create strong unity. 
when you don't have the ability to make anything you want, when you give yourself a structure or limitations, it sometimes can really help you create stronger design. It's hard to see sometimes when you're starting out because you really love the freedom of being able to do anything you want, which sometimes can be really useful, but sometimes having limitations can really drive a design. It can really help you make stronger work because you have to focus on what you're capable of doing and not have every single option in the universe available to you. So one place we see this is modular typography. Here's a piece by Joseph Albers, his modular type. And this is interesting because you can see the alphabet down below, but then above you can see the different shapes and modules that he used to create this typography. So this is a very strong style, a very interesting letter form creation, which is driven specifically by the limitation of only using these certain modules to create these letter forms. Here's another example of modular typography. This one's from a Mookie studio in Ecuador. And this is an example of modular type that was created from motifs that were found at a cultural anthropology museum in Ecuador. So these are experiments that the designer Vanessa goes through where she actually looks at these motifs and then creates these fun experimental typefaces that usually have a very modular feeling to them. And they're really interesting. So the left, we're seeing the modules themselves. We're seeing the different shapes that are coming together to create the letter forms. And then on the right, we're seeing it actually filled with different patterns and it's using color to make it even more dynamic and come to life. So this is a really interesting and fun example and one of the many experiments that a Mookie studio has done in the same vein. If we're talking about grids and modularity, it's also important to talk a little bit about Wim Kral. He is a designer from the Netherlands. He unfortunately passed away, but he did a lot of work that was really focused on grids. His nickname was Gridnik. And this is a piece he did called Neue Alphabet. And it was a special alphabet that was built without curves. And it was built for an early technological advancement of photo lettering that was created with different kinds of slides. And so to render typography accurately using this technology, they needed to build a typeface that had no curves. And so again, those limitations creates a really strange alphabet. It's kind of interesting. There's even a modular component to the one at the bottom where it actually has circles instead of actual line work. But it's a good example of another modular typeface that was created. Here's another piece from Kral. This is a piece for the Stedelijk Museum. It's a really famous piece that he did for a Vorm Grevers exhibit. And you can see that here he's actually decided to show the grid. So the grid is actually shown, which is unusual. Normally the grid is an invisible structure we never see. But what I'm showing on the right here that's really interesting too is how that main headline or really all of the typography on this poster was created to fit on the grid. It's really neat how he uses the grid to actually build the typography for this piece. So grids are composed of a series of intersecting vertical and horizontal lines. They provide structure and help organize the design to give it harmony. So here's an example of a grid. This is a modular grid. What that means is that all of the shapes or the modules that are created by the grid are the exact same size. So here's one where all the rectangles are the same. And so that grid structure is what's creating those modules, which are those light pink areas that are the actual modules of the grid. So this is something you might see in the background of a document. And this would be how you would sort of start building pages and designing them. But by using this grid, it means that all of the pages that are designed with it will have strong unity. Here's some other examples of grids. This is from Making and Breaking the Grid. It's a great book by Timothy Samara. And you can see some different styles of grids. These aren't all modular grids. There is a modular grid on the bottom left. If you look at the right page, that's a modular grid. But some of these are just column grids, like the lower left on the left, just a simple column grid. Some of these are multiple grids. There's a modular component and then a non-modular component. So grids can be simple or complex. And what you really want to do is build a grid that works for the kind of project that you're working on. And the more you work in design, the more comfortable you'll become with grids and you'll start really seeing them as a tool that helps you work faster, that really helps you create unity and organization. A good example of where we always see grids is in the newspaper. Newspapers heavily rely on grids to build pages because they create a newspaper every day. And most newspapers are a handful of pages, sometimes dozens and dozens of pages. And for designers to be able to create that in the limited time frame that they have, they need a strong grid structure that helps drive the design. It helps make decisions for them so they can do this quickly and get the news out every single day. So here's one from the New York Times. If you look at it, you're actually looking at six columns across. So if you look at the different columns of text, although there's different stories, there's generally about six columns across this page. And that's really allowing them to have flexibility in the way that they lay this out. 
We also see grids on the web. They're really used in the same way they are in print. They're to make organization. They're to make things have structure. They're to create clarity to the information and help people understand what they're looking at. They're also really, really useful for developers, the people who actually build websites. You might design something, but a grid structure will really help them work more quickly and build your website in a much more unified way. So here we're seeing a grid laid on top of the New York Times webpage. So you can start seeing how things fit in that structure and how they use that grid to create organizational unity. Here's some grids in art. Here's work from Piet Mondrian, very famous for his work using grids. He uses black lines that divide up the canvas and then he fills some of those areas with primary colors. So it might be work that you're familiar with, but an example where grids sort of entered the fine art space. There's also art that uses grids that we don't see, grids that help divide up the composition in an interesting way, but Piet Mondrian's work is a good example of grids that are very apparent. He's really showing us the grid and actually becomes the focus of his artwork. We also see grids in our cities. There's grid structures to cities and places that help us divide up the space of these places to help us find things. So sometimes they're more linear geometric grids like what you're seeing in Portland, right? There's perpendicular lines, both horizontal and vertical that run together that are all of the streets that create blocks that help you know that 17th street comes after 16th street, etc. But then there's other ones like Dubai where there's more of a circular grid structure or even this one we see of Sacramento where there's more of a neighborhood grid where there's a lot of curving streets which helps make sure that people don't speed and they slow down and it creates more interest to the suburban environment. So grids are something we see all over the place and grids really are as ancient as civilization is. If we really think about it, grids have been around since we as a human society have worked to organize ourselves and where we fit into the world. It's not a European invention, although it's often credited to being created for graphic design or design in general through some of the European schools of design. But if you really think about it, this is something that comes from the beginning of civilization. We have always been trying to organize ourselves to create structure, which creates clarity and a hierarchy to who we are. So here's an example of a rural village in Uganda. And you can see that there's sort of these fences being used and these groupings of areas that are dividing up the space of this village. And you could argue that's an example of a grid structure. It may not be from Switzerland and it may not be used on a famous poster, but you can obviously see that this concept of grids is something that's borrowed and has probably been around since the beginning of civilization. Here's another example of grids. This is the Egyptian canon of proportion. This is something that was used by the Egyptians to help ensure that the proportions of human bodies were always consistent. So whether they were as big as the side of a building or small on the side of a pot, they wanted to make sure that those proportions were consistent. So they had a grid structure that helped them ensure that as these different figures were translated at different sizes, they always had a similar proportion. And then we see grid structures going back to the beginning of writing. We often see grids used in the Western world, but they were heavily used in the Eastern world. Here we have the Chu Silk Manuscript from China. And this is an ancient, ancient document, but you can see that there's a grid structure here that's organizing the typography, that's organizing the different characters into rows and columns that helps it be readable. So again, this is not a European invention. It's not something that is that new. It's something that we've always been using to try to rationalize our choices and make things clear and organized. Here's more ancient examples. Here's ancient Greek temples. The left you have the Parthenon and the right we have the Temple of Concordia. And then below them you can see the layout of how they're built. And you'll notice that there's a very interesting structure to where the columns are placed. They're lined up. This is not arbitrary. There's very much a structure that's dictating where these columns are placed. There's an even amount of spacing between them, which you could also argue is an example of a grid system. So again, an ancient civilization that's using grids and modularity to really help create rational organized decisions. Here's a contemporary building. This is an image from the New York Times of an apartment building, but you can see this really interesting use of grid, right? There's the windows are always in the same spot, the doors, there's a repetition of that from floor to floor, which creates this really interesting organizational structure. Here's another building. This is from a building in Athens, the Urban Stripes apartment building by Clab Architecture. And although it's maybe not as regular as the example we looked at before, there's a clear grid structure here. The windows aren't just arbitrarily placed, although it looks like it. They line up in certain areas. Although the balconies are slightly offset, they also fall on that same grid. 
So it's a really interesting use of grid here and a more complex use of grid than the example from the New York Times image. But what's happening here is grid is actually creating a constraint that's making interest. They're playing with the grid to really make this building facade feel very random, even though there's an organizational quality to it that makes it feel rational. Here's another example of a modular grid in editorial design. So we looked at a modular grid earlier, but here it is with content behind it. So you can start seeing how the typography, the image, the caption, the page numbers, everything fits within that grid structure. And again, this makes our lives easier when we're working on page layout. It helps us lay things out more quickly. It helps us know where things need to fit and it helps us be able to create strong unity across multiple pages. So guidelines are not quite a grid. A guideline is similar to a grid in that it creates a little bit of structure, but it's something we use more for things that aren't very complicated. A really famous example of this is this Joseph Mueller Brockman piece, the Der Film poster. There's really just one guideline here. You wouldn't call this an entire grid. There's this vertical line that's coming in that everything is lined up against, right? And what makes this interesting is the way they're layering Der and Film. Film lines up on that guideline, but Dur actually left the lines off the edge of the poster. And that layering is where the interest is created in this poster, but you wouldn't consider this a grid. It's more of a guideline, but that can be useful too. Doesn't mean a grid is better than a guideline. This is just simpler content that doesn't need a strong grid system to make the piece work. Also, we often use grids on things that have multiple pages or multiple pieces that we want to unify. If it's just one poster or one piece, you may need to use a grid, but you also very easily could use a guideline like in this Brockman piece. So something to consider, guidelines can be really useful, but they're not quite a grid. It's almost like just one part of a grid, but sometimes you need something that simple. Sometimes that's all you really need. And I think that gets it that grids are a tool for you. You wanna use only as complex of a grid as you need. And sometimes you don't need a grid. Sometimes a guideline is enough because these grids should really work for you. They should make your work easier to produce and work with you to create strong unity. It shouldn't be something that you fight. Here's a piece from Revolver Magazine. This was done by Todd Weinberger. It's a really interesting opening to a article. And you'll see that there's a really cool use of photos, the way they kind of inset into each other. The typography is placed in interesting ways. It even has an interesting alignment that references the way that the photos line up. There's even parts of the headline that are split up. So there's a lot of interest going on here. And a lot of this is driven by the grid. Because if I kind of highlight all of the images, you'll notice that they make an interesting shape. And even when I add all of the typography, the shape is also interesting. And all of this is being built by the grid. But another thing that grids will do is when you use a grid to place content, it also activates the white space in an interesting way. One of the things that makes this piece really interesting is that the white space is well-placed, well-proportioned, and it's interesting. And the grid is really what's driving that. So sometimes by using grids, in addition to creating organizational unity and structure, you're also activating white space and making the white space really interesting. When we're discussing grids, it's also important to talk about a 12 column grid. So here we're seeing a 12 column grid on the web and 12 is a magic number. It's a grid structure you'll see a lot, both in web and in print. Why we like 12 column grids is that it's divisible by a lot of other numbers. So you can combine these columns together and create a related grid that will still have the same structure and organization, but gives you versatility. So you can have 12 columns like this, or you could mix two of them together and you could have six columns, or you could mix them together again and you could have three columns of four or four columns of three. So because 12 is a a unique number and that it's divisible by a lot of other numbers and it can be combined in different combinations where you don't end up with one grid on its own. That's why we often see 12 column grids. They're very common in the web and also very common in print. Here's some work from Trina Design. They're a local agency in San Diego and they do a lot of work for UCSD. This is their magazine for UCSD and both of these pieces use a 12 column grid. This table of contents is really interesting because you might not think it's on a grid because there's things that don't quite line up. There's that activated white space, which is really interesting. But if you count across this entire spread and really look, you'll start noticing that there is a 12 column grid structure being used here. So if we start on the very right, you'll see that 68 where it says organ match. So that is the narrowest column. So if you look below that, you'll see the equity through education and the recollecting David. So those are actually where they're taking two columns and combining them together to create a slightly larger column. So we know that that's two. So if we go to the left, we see where it says well-worn and precision meditation. That's also two columns. Then there's white space to the left of that that's the same width. So there's another two columns. So by looking at that, 
we have two, four, six, which means there's a six column grid on that side, which is also being used on the left. So you can start seeing how grids are interesting, how you can combine columns together to create something really dynamic. And you might not even realize that there's a grid going on here, but there's a very strong 12 column grid that's being used and divided and combined in interesting ways that creates a piece that's really dynamic, but also really well organized and structured. Here's some work from Marcos Key. It's a design firm out of Brooklyn. And this is a book called Black Futures, a book that they created that also has a really interesting grid structure. They mix it in different ways. It applies to the way they use the photos on the grid as well. And here it's just a really nice way to create unity across this very large book. This book is hundreds of pages long. So not only did the grid create that unity throughout, but also really helps maintain a structure that makes it really easy to look at and really easy to see how it's organized and something that has strong unity. It feels very cohesive. So we're going to be working on two assignments for grids and modularity. In the first one, you're going to use the illustrator template that we provide which has all of these black squares. There's actually nine quadrants, but each quadrant is made up of nine black squares. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna create colored compositions out of these. You can use any colors you like, and you can play with the kinds of compositions that you create. But the goal here is to look at how these colors can connect. Even though they're segmented because there's the nine modules and there's white space between them, you can actually bridge those by using colors across those gutters from each other to create unity. This is something where you can play with creating pixel art, you can play with creating different patterns, and it can be a really interesting way to see how you can use a grid structure and color to create unity. Here's some examples of that. So you can see on the right, the way that that bottom portion, which is almost like sand, right? There's that beige area that connects across the three modules to the right, and the color is what's connecting that. Same thing with the water that's right above it. So you're seeing how color can create connections across these grid structures. The left one's a little bit more of an abstract pattern, but similarly, you're seeing this radiating kind of sun-like shape, and it's created by the use of color that runs in diagonal ways around the photo. So you'll be creating four of these in total, and it's up to you how you wanna use color, what kind of imagery you potentially wanna create, if you wanna create any at all. But the goal here is to look at how you can use color to connect the grid or even sometimes split the grid up. That can be another strategy that you can take here. In the second part, you're gonna use the other Illustrator template that was provided. And when you open it up, make sure that your guidelines are being displayed because this one is really about experimenting how you place things within a grid structure. We're sort of gonna simulate the idea of creating a layout using text and images. So you're gonna create gray rectangles of two distinct values and build 10 compositions within the provided guidelines or grid. Imagine the lighter gray as text and the darker gray as imagery and you're creating digital layout sketches. Oftentimes when we make sketches for layouts, we sort of do it this way, although we do it by hand. We might kind of shade in a box to indicate a photo. We might kind of create some lighter lines that show us where some text is. But this is ultimately what it's gonna look like. So imagine that you're creating some kind of a sketch for maybe a poster or a magazine layout, or maybe even for a website or a social media post. So here's some examples where you're seeing those dark image areas and those lighter areas that represent text. But what's important is that everything must fit on the grid. That'll be one of the important parts of this assignment. It has to completely fit on the grid and take up entire modules. So don't forget there's always software tutorials for both of these that will walk you through the process of working with the template files in the software. And your instructors are always available to you if you have any questions at all. But I hope you enjoy learning more about grids and modularity and how you can use them in your work to create more structure and unity in your future design projects.